Metformin has been shown as a glucose disposal agent, as an upregulator of AMP kinase to be anti-advanced glycation end product, literally ages. And glycation is blood sugar damage, and that leads to inflammation, dyslipidemia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we've seen metformin be the most powerful anti-aging agent thus far more than anything i know of i've had a, a love hate thing with with biohacking i think ever since i started keto and and doing the deep dive in supplements trying to fix myself you know i love the idea of having the solid foundation of self-love of community of growth mindset and then using these other things for resilience for uh, improved allostatic load, which I talk about in the book. What are the differences you've seen 20 years ago with keto versus today? And what are some of the really blunders a lot of people make and mistakes they make with keto today? Sean Wells, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast, brother. Oh, thanks for having me on, Ben. I love you. I love you right back. You're such a, a great soul, great energy, great mind. You've got so many credentials behind your name, so it's clear that you're knowledgeable, but more importantly than that, you're a terrific human being, and I'm so grateful you're on the show for the first time, long overdue, and you have a new book that will be out from the release of this podcast called The Energy Formula, and we're going to talk all about that. Before we do, please share your story with my audience, share it with me. How did you get involved with what you're doing today, Sean? Oh, wow. Um... Yeah, that's a great question. First off, by the way, I remembered, like, what was it about a year ago with Keith Norris, you, me, Luis? Yeah. We were doing like a harder to kill resilience kind of thing together. Uh, anyway, but th that's a great question that you just asked. Um, and, you know, anyone that's passionate about what they do, there's like usually the big why, the kind of hero's journey, if you will. And it's the same for me. I grew up in a uh, chaotic home, if you will, and, uh, and, and uh, bullied uh, at school and constantly made fun of. I was overweight and I had a lot of depression, suicidal thoughts that I was dealing with. And I was someone that always pushed myself for achievement. I felt insecure, um, did well in school. I got into this uh, school, Babson College. It was the number one business specialty school in the country. And I was going to do business because that's what everyone told me to do. Go make money, go get a job at like Anderson Consulting, get your white picket fence. Hopefully you can make six figures. I was thinking a hundred grand and, and some business job that's living the dream. And it's, and that's as far as I can go. Not even thinking that you can just work at something that's a passion. This is before like Instagram and Insta famous and, and influencers and just chasing the things you love. Like at that time, like in the world, like there wasn't a lot of uh, inspirational figures in the world. Um, and I ended up like getting really into supplements, uh, you know, taking supplements and working out and seeing all these changes in my body, going to the gym and uh, reading all the books like Arnold's uh, and encyclopedia, I was reading this um, Optimum Sports Nutrition, Dr. Michael Colgan, where he's combining different amino acids for GH, you know, which was cool at the time. And I was reading all the bodybuilding magazines. And I went to my doctor and told him, you know, how excited I was about this stuff. And he saw the changes in my body type. And I was like, man, this stuff's so cool. Like, what do you think? And I was thinking that he's going to make fun of it. And he ended up like grabbing a piece of paper and drawing out a lifeline for me and saying, you know, here's 20, here's 80. Why not be happy between here and here? And I was like, whoa, <laughs> <laughs> whoa, bro. Like, because he's just a doctor. Like, I mean, granted, like I thought that's like as high as it gets in my world, like to be a doctor, but I, like, this isn't his job per se. And for him to tell me that, like it gave me license is like, I can just like do something that excites me. Like, you know, I always thought that was for like, I mean, to be honest, like, you know, people that like are artists and whatever, like we're, we're escaping the real world. And that's what I was told like my whole life up until that point. And so I was like, wow, I could just be a formulator. I could be like, work with athletes. I could work with 
you know, all this stuff. And, and uh, that was so exciting to me, this idea. So I decided to pursue that. Uh, I finished up school at Babson and then um, I had to uh, work on all these prerequisite classes. So I, my parents were down in North Carolina. My dream school was UNC Chapel Hill. And I would need a ton of classes uh, and sciences to get in there because I was a business student. And so I went to UNC Greensboro and I told this counselor all about my dream. And he laughed at me. And he said, you're a business student and you'll fail and you'll fail miserably. Uh, that's 26 credit hours a semester of straight sciences. That's a disaster. And you're not even in that good of shape. And I left there crying and almost committed suicide that night with pills and alcohol because someone took away this dream that this other doctor gave me. And so like the power of words is definitely front and center in my life and something I've thought about ever since that someone that didn't even realize how powerful their words were like and gave me my whole career and where I am, this doctor. And then this other guy almost took my life because of what he said. And that stayed front and center when I interact with people, why I try and have a positive impact. Um, that's It's really impacted me. But I, I ended up obviously not killing myself. That strengthened my resolve. That guy had a big impact on me as well moving forward because I thought of him every single day for the next two years. The counselor? The counselor. I thought of what he said to me every single day day people would be like hey you want to go out and party you want to go to the restaurant you want to go to the bar you want to go to this club i'd be like nope 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 <laughs> i was thinking of that guy and i ended up graduating with straight a's ended up getting into chapel hill my dream school working on nutritional biochemistry exercise science all the stuff getting my rd uh, but actually before i finished that up i hit another roadblock um, where i got I was crashing because I was working so much and doing my master's and uh, my autoimmune uh, system just like exploded basically where uh, I was nearly dead. I had Epstein-Barr virus, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, Hashimoto's, and I was in bed for about six months uh, with pain and inflammation that was devastating. Again, thinking of committing suicide because I didn't think I would ever be a functioning member of society, let alone this formulator, dietitian, all these things. I thought I'd just be in bed the rest of my life. And um, that was a dark place. But I ended up finding keto, uh, which is really cool. Like while I was really sick and I was in school for dietetics, this was 20 years ago that I was reading up on, on keto and I was reading uh, The Body Opus by Dan Duchesne. Uh, it was all like how to like do bodybuilding and get ripped doing the ketogenic diet. And then I was reading uh, Ketogenic Diet for the Practitioner by Lyle McDonald. Wow. And these were like both way ahead of their time. And, uh, and then I was reading on some message boards, which was the thing back then. And, uh, and I, I stumbled into the ketogenic diet and I ended up having all that pain and inflammation go away and leaning up. And I was able to finish up my master's and, you know, get out into the work world. And that was a game changer for me. Uh, but about eight years ago on this continued health journey and lessons of me being very tough on my body, uh, I was working at Dimatize, my dream job as a supplement formulator in the industry incredible, like, you know, doing all the formulations. And I was working about 80 hours a week because we were trying to sell the company. And if you've ever worked at a company that's positioning itself for sale, it's, it's a mad dash and a lot of work. And uh, I got a brain tumor, a pituitary adenoma while I was there. And a lot of my systems were crashing as a result. And that's when I got into like brain health. And you know, like, so I moved from like, aesthetics because I was you know had body dysmorphia and eating disorders and then I moved into autoimmune and longevity then I moved into brain health you know with the with ketones and MCTs and nootropics and then you know that's where like my journey it's kind of like 
all the things that I've been through, I've pulled into my career and become my passions. And then about a year and a half ago, I started getting into plant medicine. And that's when I finally learned to love myself. Like I had been driving almost my whole life, hard charging with achievement, you know, needing those letters after my name, needing to get on TV and documentaries and get in bigger rooms and getting attention and all that stuff because I didn't love myself. I didn't believe in myself, no matter what level I got to. I always felt like the next level, people will see me, people will recognize me, I will have attention, they will give me love, and then I will love myself. Hmm. And it wasn't until I got into the plant medicine space that I was able to give myself that, to be proud of myself, to love myself, and then have that even keel energy to give it back out. Like, I was always helping people along the way, but it, w- it was draining too. And I think taking a toll on my body. And it wasn't until like I filled up my own cup mm-hmm. that I was really able to, to help other people in a way that energized me. And so that was the big shift. And now I'm getting into um, formulations that are, that are helping with uh, these journeys, like both microdosing and full dosing, um, you know, what it looks like around that. And I'm still working on mitochondrial health and anti-aging and all that kind of cool stuff. So it's just, it's just, yeah, like following like what's happened in my life and, and my passions uh, and follow as a result. Yeah. What a journey. Uh, uh, I didn't understand. I didn't know your story to that extent. That's really remarkable. You've had that pain to purpose message several times over your lifetime. I'm curious with the severe autoimmune diseases you had, what were the contributing factors to that besides eating probably more carbohydrates and processed foods were there other things that contributed to it those are those are big those are big ones like i was because of the depression i was fighting and the degree to which i had disordered eating and body dysmorphia i mean literally ben like uh, i was like you i believe like i was 300 pounds at one point then i was 150 at another when I was anorexic and then I was 220 pounds jacked and ripped and I uh, was orthorexic. Hmm. Like, so I've been through it, but yeah, I would, I would, I would definitely fall into junk food patterns for sure as like solace to, to the depression and loneliness I was dealing with and, and even suicidal thoughts uh, for a long time. Like that was one of the, the only solaces I had was, was Reese's peanut butter cups and Coca-Cola and all those things. And, you know, certainly alcohol when I got into college and and those kinds of things. And, you know, but I would say uh, it was, it was the, the pressure I was putting on my body constantly, the hate. Like I remember uh, thinking like if I had like a knife, like, like I would dream about this all the time, just cutting the fat off my body because I hated my body so much. You know, it was like an unhealthy, like, and, and when I get unhealthy with this autoimmune stuff, I felt betrayed by my body. Mm-hmm. And like, when you're thinking like this way, like when your body is betraying you and you hate your body, that it's just an unhealthy place to be. And of course I was also driving like my whole life. I feel like I've worked 80 plus hours a week and I've always been heads down grinding you know, like on that message where like somehow grinding is a good thing, like the Gary Vee's of the world tell us, right? When, when let's think about grinding and the heat and the smoke and the pieces breaking off and the physics of it, does that sound like a good thing when your head's down? Is that how life should go? It doesn't sound healthy. Grinding. (laughs) So So I, I had two phases in my life of sympathetic, ultra sympathetic. Like I never was in parasympathetic really until uh, until I believe this this plant medicine state like where that was like one of the first times I felt like my vigilance go down and my body like fully relax and settle in. I spent my whole life grinding and pushing and wanting more and feeling like I wasn't good enough and where I was at wasn't good enough. So uh, that was the game changer for me. When you got diagnosed with the pituitary tumor, how how did you get diagnosed with that? I mean, did you have some symptoms like blurry vision yeah. or high luteinizing hormone? I mean, what was going on when that happened? Yep, exactly. Uh, that's exactly it. Um, 
I had uh, extremely high prolactin, uh, high beta estradiol, super low testosterone. It was like in the 70s. Um, and, uh, and I had bad headaches and blurry vision, like exactly what you're saying. I wasn't getting much sleep. I was trading, you know, muscle for fat. I wasn't necessarily getting fat, but I was kind of getting skinny fat. Um, and I just felt exhausted and unable to focus all the time. And that's when I knew like something's not right here and uh, ended up going into the doctor and getting those tests and seeing that blood work that I was talking about. And then we got the scans and, and got confirmed on that. And I've been on cabergoline ever since, which is um, uh, a dopamine agonist uh, that keeps it at bay. And then I take um, an aromatase inhibitor to keep the uh, estrogen under control. And I take um, uh, testosterone to replace that. And then obviously I've done a lot of things in terms of my uh, cognitive health and, and neuroprotection just because I'm at greater risk. And that's a big reason why I've, I've definitely leaned into keto too, is like I'm at higher risk for you know, brain cancer, um, and, and those things. So I, I recognize that and, uh, and I don't want to go down that path. So it's, it's helped me stay truer to paleo keto fasting as my holy Trinity, if you will. So you decided not to get surgery for the tumor. Is, is that yeah. what you decided you to, to, yeah. to go the other route? Why, why did you make that decision? I mean, it's just a lot of risk when you're opening up the brain and, and, um, yeah, it's just for me, like I knew I, I took this path and saw like over a year's time that it was basically kept extremely minimized to where it wasn't having a negative impact anymore. And I know that I can control it with diet, with these medications, with supplements. So that's that's the path I'd rather go than surgery. Absolutely. So you have started keto 20 plus years ago before keto was even really keto. Right. And, uh, and fast forward to today, it's, it's one of the top search terms on Dr. Google. So what are the, what are the things you've seen back then with keto? Uh, what are the differences you've seen 20 years ago with keto versus today? And what are some of the really blunders a lot of people make and mistakes they make with keto today? Biggest things, um, I'd say like, five years ago paleo became a thing with keto maybe two or three years ago fasting became a thing with keto i would say when i started keto those weren't things um and doing you know uh, artificial sweeteners and lots of diet sodas and you know making your own keto desserts and lazy keto dirty keto like a lot of my meals were like uh, at Burger King and KFC and, you know, places that I was used to going and could afford, honestly, at the time as a college student. Um, so, you know, like back then that was normal for keto. Like there, it wasn't like, it was about getting into ketosis. Like there wasn't that focus on like the nutrient quality like there is now. So it would be like, you know, eating like two, you know, grilled chicken sandwiches with, you know, without the bun and having the mayo and the cheese or whatever, like that would be keto, you know, and having a Diet Coke. So that was keto at the time. And I would say like the, the things that I've seen messed up through the years is kind of the difference between like Atkins, which somewhat like uh, affected my path at that time. Um, and, and keto is that like Atkins was like, it really doesn't, unless you're talking about that induction phase, like Atkins was like much higher in protein. So it was like, you could, you could just have like all the, you know, all the things and, and, you know, and, and I've kind of evolved on going from originally being like, eat as much protein as I want to being much lower in protein to now, like, I don't really care anymore. <laughs> so, um, and I think we were talking about that at biohacking Congress a little bit. Yeah, uh, it's an interesting thought process around protein and gluconeogenesis. It, it's something to be aware of, and I wasn't truly aware of it at at the time. But um, you know, that's something. And then I would say that uh, it does happen sometimes that that when you're eating sometimes too much protein. I feel like some people get into like this hypoglycemic sensitivity like where 
like small fluctuations can feel like huge fluctuations because you're not used to having glucose for fuel and you're really not like, you know, keto adapted and using fat for fuel. You're like in this like bodybuilder, eat clean, like high protein, low carb, low fat world. Mm -hmm. And it can be punishing. I remember like doing the bodybuilder diet and on my brain, on my hunger, like I would wake up and want to punch people like I needed to eat immediately. <laughs> like I was like in a rage. And like when you're whenever I do crank up my fat, it's not necessarily like I need the fat higher because like my key, ketones need to be higher. But when I do crank up my fat, I do feel more satiety and I do feel like it's almost hard to eat, which can be its own challenge. Like if I do carnivore with high rendered fat, like I am struggling. Me to too. Eat. <laughs> yeah, same. So, so the higher those ketones get, like, you know, the more you're just struggling to eat. And um, so that's something to be aware of. Uh, and I would say, yeah, that um, also one thing that I brought up at Biohacking Congress was that uh, I think I see this a lot with women where they say, I just can't get into ketosis. And you know, they're doing 50 grams and it's net carbs and all this stuff. And, you know, they're doing like the having the short chain fibers and the, and the sugar alcohols and all these things. And what I've found is, you know, you need like a period of time. I think you said six, 30 to 60 days. Like I, I, I say in my book, like 90 days of strict keto to adapt so that you, one, you make those epigenetic changes Two that you know what it feels like to be in like a pure deep ketosis and you can anchor to that so that when you start playing around with net carbs cyclical or targeted ketogenic dieting you know what this oh that's yeah, i know what ketosis feels like and i'm not in it whether you're using meters or not because meters can kind of betray you a little bit because you're adapting and you might be utilizing those ketones exactly which I'm sure you talk to people about as well so, but what I found too is that the um, the amount of carbohydrate tolerance you have, and this really is true with protein too, because of gluconeogenesis, et cetera, that the more muscle mass you have, the more active you are with that muscle mass, the more carbohydrate and protein protein tolerance you have. And so, and this isn't just women, but I've heard about it more with women because they may have less muscle mass and be potentially less active with that muscle mass. And this is, wouldn't be true of some crossfitting right. super athletic woman, but you know, soccer mom, whatever, like, you know, maybe she has less muscle mass and is less active, a little bit more sedentary. Then for her, she may not even be able to do 50 grams of, you know, strict, non, non, uh, um, starchy uh, carbs. Yeah. And so like, she may need to go like to 20. And that's what I talk about in the book is like, I start for that 90 days at 20 grams of, of strict carbs of strict ketogenic so that you can like feel what that's like. And it's going to work for everyone. And, you know, I've known bodybuilders along, you know, proving this point out that have been able to go to a hundred grams of mm -hmm. carbs and stay in ketosis because, one of my friends is like, you know, 280 pounds jacked and he's like, you know, putting in two hours a day at the gym and he can eat like some Oreos and stuff and stay in ketosis. It's like, it's insane and it's frustrating to other people, but that's the great equalizer. I believe is the glute four translocation and, and having uh, active muscle and that that's, that's the game changer. So that's where something like a glucose disposal agent can be helpful. Uh, that I talked about uh, in my in my uh, presentation, like dihydroberberine or or at least regular berberine or metformin or something along those lines. And uh, you actually said that one of your greatest favorite supplements, not just for blood sugar regulation but anti aging, is the berberine. The dihydro uh, say that again. Dihydroberberine is that how you say it? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Because metformin has been shown. Uh, as a glucose disposal agent, as an upregulator of, of AMP kinase uh, to be uh, 
anti-advanced glycation end product literally ages uh, and glycation is blood sugar damage and that leads to inf in inflammation, dyslipidemia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we've seen metformin be the most powerful anti-aging agent thus far, more than anything I know of. And that's why for 20 years, people have been taking it for that reason. Even people that are super lean and seeing hemoglobin A1C, a blood sugar marker, and seeing CRP, an inflammation marker, telomere, DNA, methylation, et cetera, all of that improved. There was a study a couple of years ago, I think 2019, where they had, I believe for 90 days, they had, um, it was DHEA, zinc, I think, uh, GH, and metformin. And in those 90 days, people's biomarkers looked like there was an improvement of two years of longevity. Wow. So this is just insane. And there's actually a study that's starting now with metformin that's 3,000 people, I mean, which is a massive study uh, on this kind of anti-aging exploration. And berberine in a study head-to-head -head was shown to outperform metformin. Um, and so dihydroberberine is... The, the active metabolite of berberine. At the gut, uh, berberine converts to dihydroberberine mm -hmm. and, then, and then it actually goes to the plasma and then converts back to plasma berberine. But, so it's already converted for you is what you're saying. Yeah, what's cool is uh, the dihydroberberine is about five to 10 times more bioavailable so you can take much lower doses. Doesn't have the GI distress of berberine or metformin that some people have. Uh, and it lasts about twice as long in the plasma. So this is just, yes, for keto, powerful. For uh, people that are diabetic, powerful. For anti-aging, powerful. So this is just, and we know that probably, you know, only 1% of disease is, is genetic per se, like the other 99% is metabolic related. So this is going to be a powerful anti-disease, anti-aging uh drug essentially like this is this is the most powerful thing i know of that you can take of drug of supplements of diet it's just powerful um and so that ranks atop my list is dihydroberberine have you tested your glucose levels maybe with the cgm mm -hmm. using it versus not using it yeah so i mean i have but like here's an example i remember when i was first testing out berberine which i formulated a ton of supplements with like it's one of the What's crazy? It's like you look up Sean Wells, like Berberine's like one of the top things on Google. Oh, that's cool, uh, dude. Because <laughs> I formulated a lot of supplements with Berberine before I even got to dihydroberberine. And I remember I was formulating this product IC5 for Biotrust. It has like cinnamon and chromium and um, uh, some other ingredients. I'm not thinking of uh, bioavailability enhancer and Naringin. And I was just trying the, the full dose of, of Berberine. And I was taking, I took my, my carbohydrate challenge instead of 75 grams of dextrose was, I'm, I'm making this fun for myself, two Pop-Tarts that were frosted and five double stuff Oreos. My Yum. blood sugar went from like 65, 70, uh, like my fasting blood glucose to uh, 199 in two hours. Without it. And looking at it like every 30 minutes and without, without any berberine. Got it. The next time I, I did it like a week later, the same thing, you know, got back in ketosis, the whole thing, um, and took it with the berberine. I never got above a hundred. And at one hour I was already coming back down. Wow. You know how insane that is? Like, and I've had so many friends, like when I formulated IC5, take that, like the dihydroberberine is pretty new to market, but like take that product and like eat you know, cake and whatever, and, and kind of stay in ketosis. I mean, you can't go crazy, crazy, but it's like, it's insane, like how effective it is. So uh, it's definitely something that's, uh, if you're going to have a carbohydrate cheat meal, I don't like to call them that, like I just have planned carbohydrates. Um, right, but if yeah. you're going to do that, then this is definitely a great equalizer. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't like the word cheat meal. I, I call them the keto flex days, right? The high carb yeah, days. I so, love that. So having that before the meals could be a great way, not only to help regulate the glucose, but when you want to go back into ketosis, you'll get there even faster because you're not going to get that huge spike in glucose and insulin. So where can we get dihydroberberine? 
Uh, one of my favorite products, I don't get money from this, but like this guy, like his products are great. Uh, Rob Oliver Genius brand. Um, it's on Amazon. Like what I like about him, like if I was to get into all my supplement spiel about what makes a good supplement, it would be full transparency. It would be using the correct doses found in studies, you know, listing each ingredient, no proprietary blends, having branded ingredients when possible. I mean, this adds so much cost to your testing and to buy branded ingredients can be two, three, four, five times the cost uh, because those have the research behind them and the quality. That's what he does with everything. I haven't even formulated anything for him. This is me just saying like he's doing things Impressive. very well. And I, I used his, uh, his genius pre-workout for years because I don't usually take caffeine and he has a caffeine free pre-workout that I love. And um, this he has great products. And so he has a product called Genius Blood Sugar that has uh, Glucovantage, the branded form of dihydroberberine in it. And that's probably my favorite one. Very cool. I haven't heard of it before. Have you been in contact with him yet or no? Does he just hear you talking about him positively on shows or what? <laughs> I've hollered at him a few times and say like, hey, your sales might be going up. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm like shouting you out on a lot of podcasts because people like inevitably say like, well, what's the product? Like I don't try and push anything. I'm just yeah. like, but people are like, well, tell us where we get it. And I'm like, okay, uh -huh. well, here's one. I mean, there's probably 20 products that have it, but I just, I do like repping someone that's, that's doing all the right things. Yeah. I love that. And I would have gotten that question from the keto camper. So I'm glad you answered it before I had to find the answer. I, I want to spend the final uh, 20 minutes or so about your book. You know, your book is called the energy formula, six life-changing ingredients to unleash your limitless potential. The book is out now, you know, by the time that this podcast is out there and you were telling me that you've spent about two years writing it, you went, uh, did a first version, second version, re-record the audio to really make it an A plus book. So what does that word mean to you? Limitless potential. Why did you put that on the subtitle? You know, I've had a, a love hate thing with, with biohacking. I think ever since I started keto and, and doing the deep dive in supplements, trying to fix myself. I mean, maybe going all the way back to that conversation with that doctor when I was trying to fix my my body dysmorphia and really go into sports nutrition, then working on um, on my inflammation and pain and immunity, then working on my brain health. Like I've been biohacking for a long time, for 25 plus years, but there's an element of that word that I don't like now that I've learned that. I hated myself so much and pushed myself so hard. And there's a lot of this story in the book that you need the self-love, you need the community, you need like uh, the growth mindset, you need to not necessarily like hack as much. Like that, the word triggers me a little bit. Like I use the word a lot. I'm on Clubhouse at biohacking. That's so right. I, <laughs> I use the word because people connect with it, but for me, like I was telling you, I had dreams of literally cutting my body apart, of hacking into myself. I wanted the quick fix because I hated myself. And, you know, I love the idea of having the solid foundation of self-love, of community, of growth mindset, and then using these other things for resilience, for uh, improved allostatic load, which I talk about in the book, that being harder to kill, being more anti-fragile, health optimizations on top of that solid foundation and not me feeling like my body's betraying me or hating my body or hating who I am and trying to hack it out. Mm. And so that limitless potential, I just want people to know that they're already perfect. They're already beautiful. It's just finding ways to, it's just like, as I've explored plant medicine, I'm just finding more and more ways to fall in love with who I am and see greater and greater potential. You know, it's like, or like you love the first kid you might have and you think, well, how can I have more love if I have another kid? But you do. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I, I believe you're already at a hundred percent, but you can have more hundred mm percent -hmm. if that makes sense. And so that's what I'm talking about in the book is like, I feel like we are limitless. We are eternal. We are infinite. And, and just like with, um, you know, these books about, um, you know, the, the body keeps the score like you've talked yeah. about or um, or uh, like Bruce Lipton's book or um, 
uh, you know, all these guys that are talking about the power of the mind and, and what our body can do. And it just seems like we keep unlocking more and more and more. And we're shifting from, uh, I think, wasn't it, was it Thomas DeLauer that talked about like that we're shifting from homo sapien to homo luminous or whatever, but yes. like, yeah. Um, I love that idea that like there's this great awakening that's happening right now. And that's why you're seeing plant medicine explode right now. And you're seeing biohacking went from, I mean, Ben, it used to be like 15 years ago when I was really into it and I was into all the devices and things like that, that like people are putting magnets in their fingers and chips in their brain and all this stuff. And then it became, you know, stem cells and, and, you know, getting like less like intense and Android, but like, and then it became you know, supplements and bulletproof coffee and keto. And then it became breath work and journaling and gratitude and, and all this stuff. And it's like, whoa, like, and then it became plant medicine journeys and microdosing and, and connection with people and meetups. And, and it's like, whoa, like, you know, and talking about, like I talk about in the book, like blue zones and, you know, all this, like, this is like, this is biohacking. Like, so it's an interesting evolution. Uh, it went from something very harsh to something that's, that's very beautiful now, like that I'm seeing uh, with that word. And, and it has a lot to do with what's in the book is like all the, I sure I go through like all the, you know, uh, like cold plunges and red light and hot saunas and all the supplements, keto, paleo, intermittent fasting, extended fasting, MCTs, nootropics, like I get into all that stuff in there, but I wove in a lot of my story, my journey, um, you know, that the growth mindset is important. Resilience is important. Um, and that, you know, self-love is important. Mm -hmm. And that's just, I, I start out very technical. It goes experiment, nutrition, exercise, routines, growth, and your tribe. And so it goes from like kind of the most technical to like, you know, moving to kind of more woo, if you will. Uh, that's that's kind of the path that I've taken in my life too. And they're they're all important. It's important to understand your body, to have metrics, all of those things, and to understand science. There's over a hundred scientific citations in there, but it's also important to have these pieces that we've discarded for a long time that it seem not important, and that's crazy. And when they're the foundation, hmm. I believe that like we've spent so much of our time like being in boxes of mask, no mask, Black Lives Matter, anti-Black Lives Matter, Republican, Democrat, uh, Trump, Biden, you know, like put them in the box, make them angry at each other. And like, we should be like, wait, why are we in these boxes in the first place? We're all on like spectrums for a million of these things. We have so much in common with each other, but we're always getting put in boxes like things are binary. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy when we're 99.9% .9 the same across the board. We're all like, want to have love, happiness, joy, connection, and, you know, be here on this planet uh, together. Like, it's just crazy, like the way that we're, you know, pitted against each other uh, for obvious reasons. That would just be a whole other show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and like never before the divide like is what before. I'm saying. Like never before do we see, and that's the real uh, virus, if you will. It's the people who are on just opposite sides hating each other. You know, if somebody wants to wear a mask, I respect them. If somebody doesn't want to wear a mask, I respect them. You want to get a shot, I respect you. But it's the people who are actually shouting out there, what are you doing? You know, you're a Trump supporter, whatever it is. It's that divide, Sean, like you just said. And that's something I love about you. Since I, since I met you day one, you always express that message of love and community and support. I mean, you support me uh, you don't even have to do things that you do to support me with this, your stories and just your love with and friendship towards me. And I agree with you. Those are fundamental. If you don't have that, it doesn't matter what biohack you have for MCT oil or what supplements you're taking. It's just the house will fall apart wall by wall. But when you build that foundation, I love that you put it in your book and it's all interwoven in there. Then everything else upgrades by default. So I love that message. And that's something that, that makes you really special out there in the health community because you're speaking that and you're speaking speaking it consistently, brother. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I spent so much of my life learning all the biohacks because of what I was doing to myself. I think I wouldn't have survived. I think I, I truly believe I would be dead by now with a heart attack, with a stroke, with with what I was doing to me and how hard I was driving had I not done all these biohacks. But now 
I'm not surviving. I am thriving. I am heads up. I believe we're in the right place, right time all the time when we're heads up. But we're just, we don't see it a lot of the time. We don't see it because we're heads down because we're, we're surviving or we're grinding. There's so much like amazing stuff that's happening around you. There's so many incredible people that you could be connecting with. There's so many situations that are unfolding right next to you, wherever you are at line at Starbucks, that could be the incredible game changer, but your head's down. Mm -hmm. And that's what's been like incredible for me. I'm like, wow, how is all this amazing stuff coming in so fast all the time? And it's because I've shifted my mindset. It's because I have self-love. It's because I'm heads up that I'm seeing these things, that I'm engaging in these things, that people are seeing my energy and wanting to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. It's a game changer. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Exactly mm. what, what Dr. Wayne Dyer said. It's exactly what you're saying. Uh, and I love what you shared about when you have a kid. I don't have a kid, but mm -hmm. it, it makes a lot of sense that, yeah, you love that that first child so much and you can't even imagine having that same love for the second child, but you do get it. And that's the by, byproduct of a, abundance. You know, Abundance is everywhere and abundance is our birthright. One of my favorite quotes is from abundance, he took abundance and what remained was abundance, right? So it's just mindset of love and gratitude and the fact that we're all on this planet together and it's the divide. It's when we are asleep, like I was for the first 24 years of my life, I was asleep until I, I had to hit rock bottom like you to wake myself up. So I love that, Sean. And I want to get into a couple of the ingredients you have. You mentioned experiment, nutrition exercise routine, growth, and your tribe. I would like to get into exercise a little bit. Uh, I love exercise as a tool for brain performance, for autophagy, not so much for weight loss. So I would love to hear some of your favorite benefits of exercise and some ways to incorporate it for somebody who feels like they don't have the time to exercise. You know, one of the top so for longevity, there, there's a couple things I mentioned in the book. Um, this is interesting that, as an aside, um, that the greatest factor in longevity, according to the Harvard study that's over 80 years running, and they looked at over generations of people. They looked at you know blood work, uh, genetics. They looked at socioeconomic status, geographics, like whatever they found that quality of relationships was the number one predictor of longevity. So throw that out there. Again, solid foundation. All the biohacks, you know, the people in Sardinia that are living over a hundred, the super centenarians, they're not doing enemas and peptides. <laughs> Just FYI, they have purpose, they have self-love, they have community. And it's not just about red wine, trust me. Like, so uh, just as an FYI, but with exercise, um, you know, that's another one, too, is that one of the, the biggest predictors, the quickest predictor of longevity is grip strength. Hmm. And and that is that's been shown time and time again that it's it's a factor of like muscle innervation. So how's your nervous system? How's your uh, muscle mass? And with good uh, muscle mass comes bone mineral density. Uh, also comes the uh, with that innervation, muscle mass and bone density. You have the knowledge of how to use your body in space, proprioception, you know, all of this stuff like is a factor. And if you're taking time to invest into your body, you're probably taking time to invest into the nutrition, hydration you have. You're probably taking time to meditate or go to church or whatever it is you do there. You know, so there's there's so much that goes into just grip strength, right? If you really look at it. Um, so that firm handshake that your dad told you to do is is definitely a thing. Like, I mean, that's going to predict how long you live. And so it's something I think about literally like every time, like I, you know, open like a bottle, I think like, how's my grip strength? <laughs> how am I aging? Um, so it's kind of cool. And, and it's like something I like to think about with exercise. But, you know, the, the whole uh, body in motion stays in motion or what you don't use, you lose. And so it's important you know, I think we have to find ways to exercise because I have actually have a hidden chapter on natural ancestral movement as a bonus on the energyformula.com if you buy the book. So I get into this heavily is that we should find ways to crawl and move and roll around on the floor and do the things we used to do. 
And there's new data coming out on the idea of exercise snacks, exercising throughout the day, finding ways to, you know, get up, you know, like I'm, I'm here at my desk, I'm going to like get up and do some, you know, air squats or, you know, whatever for five minutes, because it's been shown that that doing the small exercise snacks throughout the day has a greater impact on your health than taking that same amount of time for one hour after you've been sedentary. Mm -hmm. So breaking up your periods of sedentary is more important than working out for that hour. And it's been shown too that like that eight hours of being sedentary, it takes 45 minutes to undo just that on your body. So it's, it's something to be mindful of that when we exercise, we're undoing how sedentary we are. And why is it that these other cultures that are living over a hundred, they're not working out in the gym because they're moving. Mm -hmm. They're not sitting around. They're not laying on the couch or sitting in a chair, getting sitting syndrome where your iliacus and psoas are like contracted all day long. And when your, your pelvis is tilted forward, your head's tilted forward. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the spine is like a C, right? So like, when, you're, when your pelvis tilts forward, your head tilts forward. Or when your head tilts forward, your pelvis tilts forward. And so all of this is happening and we're, you know, having uh, an impact on our health, on our circulation, on our lymph, like all of it from not moving. So it's important for all of these tissues in our body to, you know, have uh, the fascia, you know, along with the muscle, like our, our circulatory system, our nervous system to be moving. And I think that's the most important part of exercise. I get into like all the hacks of like high intensity interval training, blood flow restriction, like also called occlusion, which Thomas, I believe, talked about. He did. Yeah. Um, and also things like intraset stretching. Like there's all the hacks in there of like how to get greater hypertrophy in less time. Uh, but I think that's the most important thing is finding ways to move throughout the day, finding things that you think are fun and involve movement. Mm -hmm. Doing postprandial strolls are highly impactful, super easy to do, super impactful. Taking a 10 minute walk after you eat will impact your blood sugar dramatically. Mm -hmm. Again, those glute, the glute four translocation that I was talking about. So moving that body, that muscle mass, again, keeping it active is going to pull in more uh, blood glucose uh, out of, out of um, plasma. So all of those things really like, and I can get into BDNF, you know, greater uh, brain derived uh, neurotrophic factor, neuroplasticity, all that kind of stuff. But it's important to just move like we're meant to move. I love it, John. I love the idea of exercise snacks. Uh, that's something I do throughout the day. I'm standing right now. I have my stand up desk. So I'm always on my feet, walking my dog, going to my rooftop. Not only does it help with the exercise snacking, but it also helps reset these dopamine receptor sites. So I'm not on my phone. I'm not, I'm not getting that stimulation. So it's a good, good way for me to reset. I also love the idea of activating the glute for transporters via a walk after a meal or doing some squats before a big meal. It's funny because uh, not this last Thanksgiving, but the previous one, I had a big Thanksgiving get together talking about community and love. And I was explaining to everybody at the dinner table, like, hey, do you know, like in the body, we have something called the glute four transporters. And if you could activate it, you could take a lot of the glucose spike from this delicious meal and use it for energy versus fat storage. And we could just do 40 squats together and activate this glute four transporter. So everybody got up on the dinner table and we're like counting squats and then we feasted, right? So we did some damage uh -huh. control. So yes. I, I love the idea of doing that and the exercise snacks. The uh, and I want to leave the conversation with the keto cat nerdgasm. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. We'll, we'll do it the next time we feast together together at a restaurant, Sean. <laughs> Um, I want to finish the conversation with letting the keto campers know that this book is going to change your life. Get the book. Yes, you'll learn about keto. Yes, you'll learn about fasting. I, I wrote a quote here in the book. You said one of the greatest biohacks to growing physically, mentally, and spiritually is fasting. You'll learn about that, but it's much more than that. You'll hear about Sean's journey. You'll hear about love and gratitude. You'll hear about the fundamentals. You'll read about it and get to apply it and really change your life. So where is the best place for them to go get your book, Sean? Uh, energyformula.com, and uh, that's where all the bonuses are. You'll end up purchasing through amazon.com, but you definitely want to get all these bonuses. It's $1.99 uh, for... Uh, 370 plus pages, full color front to back. If you get the hardcover, it's 39.99. 
but it literally cost me thirty nine eighty to make <laughs> because it's full color front to back. Um, it's a crazy awesome book. There's over a hundred scientific citations. I have formulators corners in every chapter that goes through the brands, the doses, the forms, resource hacks that get into the devices, the techniques, the uh, apps to use. Um, I have 60 full color diagrams as well. Like it's, I have quote boxes with all these great quotes, similar to like some of the ones we threw out here. You just, it's chock full. And again, you get the hidden chapter on natural ancestral movement. You get the fasting for energy guide. I get into like how it's unique for women, or if you want to do extended fasting, all that stuff. So just tons of value for a uh, dollar 99. So go to energyformula.com. Please review it on Amazon. That would be hugely helpful to me. And also, whenever you get my book, make sure you get Keto Flex uh, because I'm a huge fan of Ben Azadi as well. And we both are orange and blue, and you should just get both books because they're both <laughs> awesome. Thank you, brother. Yeah, our books are similar in color, and they both stand out, don't they? Yes. Um, I want to acknowledge you, Sean, for the tremendous work you've been doing for 20 plus years, working on yourself, going through your trials and tribulation, depression, suicidal thoughts, tumors, autoimmune disease, and just getting through that and living on purpose with your purpose right now and expressing the message on love and purpose and community and strength and supplements and just all the things that you teach and helping us all become more resilient so we could have a happier life, a longer life, and just achieve more in life. So I love what you're doing in this world. It was such an honor to share the stage with you a, free, a few weeks ago in uh, Silicon Valley, California at the Biohacking Congress. And it was also an honor to have you on my podcast today. So go get Sean's book. We'll put all that in the notes of the podcast. And thank you for today's conversation, Sean. Oh, thank you so much, Ben. I, I do love you. I appreciate you. Your reflection of me, I believe, uh, we're just two guys that are trying to do right and, uh, and are putting out love into the world. And I just appreciate you so much. Thank you. Thank you, brother.